everybody. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Before I start today's episode, I just wanted to thank everybody who donated and prayed for us during Catholic Culture's fall fundraising campaign, which concluded on December 8th, the, the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, we, we made our uh, matching challenge grant uh, complete within uh, like 10 minutes of midnight on the 8th, so we're very grateful uh, to Our Lady for helping with us, us with that. Again, all our donors, thank you. We really look forward to producing a lot more great stuff for you in the new year. Uh, and uh, my guest today uh, has written a very interesting book, Jerome's Tears, Letters to Friends in Mourning. And this is uh, this is a collection of new translations of letters by St. Jerome. Um, and the, the subtitle explains it's letters to his friends who have been bereaved um, of uh, a close friend or a relation. Uh, very, very interesting set of letters. The translator, uh, David G. Bonagura Jr., is an adjunct professor of classical languages at St. Joseph's Seminary in New York. He teaches Latin at the Veterum Sapientia Institute and at Regis High School in New York. He's an adjunct pro professor of theology at Catholic Distance University and also serves as religion editor of the University Bookman. David, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Thomas, thanks for having me. Uh, so what gave you the idea to put together this collection of translations? I was working on Jerome's quotations of classical authors for a graduate school thesis. Jerome is known, most Catholics know him as the translator of the Bible, but he's also known for being extraordinarily learned and having one of the greatest Latin prose styles out there, up there with, with Cicero and Erasmus. If you were put three across the era, Cicero, mm -hmm. Jerome, and Erasmus would probably be your three greatest Latin style prose styles. And he's known for this love of classical learning. So I was researching in particular how he employed classical quotations within his letters. And I'm working on these, I was working on the, these consolation letters. And I'm saying, wow, these are great. It'd be pretty neat if I were to put them together in a volume together. You can find translations of St. Jerome's text, but not thematically. It takes seven of these letters. They're written over a period of 25 or 30 years and put them together in a single volume with introduction. And that's what Jerome's tears came out to be. Great. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about these letters and the nature of them. Um, they are written to all to people who were uh, good friends, right? Yeah, with one exception. He wrote to a Theodore in Spain. He never met her nor her husband. The hus they were going to both the two were going to make the long trip from Spain to the Holy Land just to meet Jerome and just to purchase some of Jerome's scripture commentaries and study the scriptures with him. And the husband Lucinius died before making the trip. So Jerome was very moved by their piety and their desire to see him. So he wrote a letter. It's the briefest letter in the volume. But I think the fact that he didn't know her and he went out of his way to write a letter makes it pretty moving that he would take the time to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and another thing worth mentioning, um, most, if not all, of the, the addressees of the letters and the people being mourned in the letters are saints, right? I mean, uh, Jerome is extolling their holiness in general. I think most of them are considered saints officially in the church as well. Is that right? Yeah, three or f maybe certainly four of them are canonized saints, as we call them today, Paula and Marcella. They're not known to most people. They'd be on the historical calendar of saints, not on the uh, liturgical calendar of saints whom we celebrate, other than, of course, Jerome. So yeah, there's some canonized recipients and some canonized uh, deceased about whom Jerome writes. Right, and that that makes for a very interesting kind of approach that Jerome takes in these letters, which we'll, of course, discuss, um, because he's writing to very particular sorts of people. Um, now, I wanted to bring up uh, this consolation genre. You meant, mentioned Jerome's classical learning. Um, I've had the opportunity to read some of the consolation letters written by Seneca, and um, of, of course, also Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy, which is, I, I mean, a little bit different, but still in that tradition to some extent. Um, and uh, could you could you just talk a little bit about this genre in general as it existed in classical antiquity and how Jerome kind of yes. updates it and, and makes his own use of it? Right. So the, I, the art of the literary epistle, what today we would call an essay is what in the ancient world they call letters, just like we have in the Bible with the letters of St. Paul to the Corinthians and Ephesians and so on. These letters of consolation were a style of Greek oratory, a Greek epistolary style that goes back to at least the fourth century BC. And if you read these particular letters, Jerome is very consciously writing in that style. All these letters 
in different ways and different shapes would at least have four of the same features, an introduction, a eulogy for the deceased, a consolation of those who are living, and then finally a, uh, a series of praises for the person who had let, died, including along with that person's lineage, was a classical move. Now, Jerome, writing in this style, but it's kind of amusing, Jerome was a learned guy and knew it, and he wasn't shy about asserting his own literary prowess over these traditions, and in particular also it's the fact that it's Christian literary tradition. He doesn't hesitate to say that the Christian way of consoling is more efficient and more moving than is the pagan form. So Jerome on a couple of occasions writes how, oh, I, I don't bother here to follow the precepts of the rhetoricians, as he calls it. So in, in making that claim or saying that, dismissing them, he's showing that, eh, you know, guess what, I'm better than they are. And he does that by, he keeps the same pattern of those four parts of each letter and moves them around. But what he does, unlike his classical predecessors, is he mixes in a tremendous amount of scriptural quotations and allusions. Every single paragraph just flowing off the page, Old Testament, New Testament. Sometimes they're passing quotations. Sometimes he uses an image from scripture as an extended metaphor. But he has all the scriptures right at his fingertips, and he's able to employ it in such adroit ways. It's really fascinating to watch on just that level. Right? You could read the letters of, Jer of these letters of Jerome on a consolatory level, but to see it as scripture in action, that alone is a very impressive thing. So in doing that, Jerome is establishing really a new genre, a new Christian genre of consolatory epistles. Yeah, and that's that's very interesting. Uh, you, you can see even in a description that he makes of uh, the sack of Rome by the um, – gosh, who is it in this case? Um, it was the first sack of Rome in 800 years. Who was it who did that? The Goths. The Goths, yeah. Uh, and he describes it. He he hasn't seen it himself because he's been far away, but he's, he's heard it described and he's describing it back to uh, the recipient of one of his letters. And uh, he first quotes one of the um, – the biblical, the Old Testament prophets about um, the uh, an attack made on Jerusalem, and then he immediately goes into Virgil's Aeneid, describing, quoting a description of the fall of Troy. Uh, so it's interesting, and 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 he seems to quote uh, the Aeneid uh, as much as anything, any other classical text um, in these letters. Uh, and this is, you know, also worth noting. Uh, you you mentioned in the introduction to the book that, you know, some people may know about this that. You know, Jerome was very attached to his classical books and his Ciceronian style, and at a certain point, he has this dream um, that uh, that he he is being punished. You know, in the afterlife, um, and and Christ says to him, "You are not a Christian; you are a Ciceronian." And at that point, he vows never to to read these books again. Um, and this is partially because he had sort of gotten to the point in his attachment to pay, uh, classical rhetoric that he was sort of looking down on the um, what he might have considered at that time the more rude rhetoric of the scriptures. Um, and uh, yet I'm assuming that all these letters are being written after that point, and yet he's still he's still quoting all these classical authors. So maybe he's not reading them anymore, but he's at least still got this this storehouse of knowledge that he's still, you know, quite happy to draw upon. That's right. And in the ancient world, they would have been much more reliant upon memorizing texts, paragraphs, lines of verse than we are today. Books were very scarce back in those days. For, so for students in Rome writing on their wax tablets, once they filled that little tablet, which is no bigger than an electronic tablet these days, they'd have to wipe it out and start all over again. So they, were chant, they had to memorize these texts. And if you look at the texts that Jerome uses, the quotations, particularly of Virgil, as you mentioned, they're shorter and they tend to be associations with, with memory rather than something that he draws off. So for instance, two times, maybe even three in these seven letters, he quotes a line from Virgil's Aeneid, Dux Femine Facte, which refers in the Aeneid to Dido, a leader of great deeds. And he uses that to describe two or three of the women whom he describes within these letters, whom he's eulogizing. So in that regard, it's like a, a thought association almost. It's, oh yeah, she reminds me of this this line that I memorized. It would have been well known to other students or you know, any other learned person in the ancient world. So those classical quotations tend to be more fleeting. As much as he loved the classics, he surely doesn't draw on them for images 
and for consolation, the way he draws on the Bible for images and for consolation. There so are extended of passages in the Bible as opposed to a, you know, like a thought association, which is probably the, the w main way he uses the classical quotations from Virgil. Right, like a turn of phrase or something like that. Right, uh, exactly. Well, it's interesting too. I mean, I'm just rereading the Confessions for the first time since college. And, you know, Augustine early on, you know, talks about his sort of his resentment at not at having been made to learn all these things from the Aeneid um, uh, and how bad that was bad for him, you know, uh, as as a young man. Um, but here, Jerome is just happily quoting at least the, the language of it. Um, to what extent is there kind of a, a stoic influence? I mean, be, and I ask that because my my familiarity with the genre prior to Jerome is just having read Seneca's Consolation. So is there kind of a stoic influence on Jerome's approach to this topic? Or is it pretty much um, all stuff that would have been in, you know, the Christian idea about death anyway? That's an excellent question. I don't think there's a stoic influence. And in fact, when he mentions, and particularly in the second letter that's in the volume, the letter to Heliodorus, who's a bishop. Now, Jerome and Heliodorus studied together in Rome when they were school children. So the equivalent of today being, say, high school age students. So they would have studied the same stuff. So of all the letters of this in the seventh volume, that one is the most styled up, if you will, in writing style, and also the mon one of the most classical allusions. But he refers to all these Greek writers. He doesn't mention Seneca once. Mm -hmm. And he does, Cicero gets a mention, but Seneca is never mentioned in any of those sources. But I think uh, Jerome's approach is, is Christian, and it features in, uniquely Christian in the sense that the emphasis is on asceticism and hope in the resurrection. Was, you, I mean, maybe one could make an argument that there's some similarities between Stoicism and asceticism. But asceticism as a Christian practice, as you know, advocated by St. Paul, who is, I don't think, a Stoic. The, uh, in that regard, I would say no, Gerard is not a Stoic in his, either in his philosophy nor in his style of letter writing. What are the, some of the things that Jerome thinks we shouldn't do uh, when we are mourning a loved one? Ah, great question. One of them is not to mourn too excessively. The, the seven letters in the volume are arranged chronologically, and that part of the reason I ended up doing that was because some of the letters refer back to prior ones that he wrote. Jerome directly just, I wrote, I consoled so-and-so earlier and on, you know, I used this theme and I consoled so-and-so on this theme. So I'm trying to try something else. He actually says that right in his introduction. So it was unavoidable to do that. But the first letter to Paula, with whom jo Jerome was friends when he lived in Rome as the advisor to Pope Damasus back in 384 to 387 or 8, and he was, I guess today we would use the term spiritual director for Paula. And Paula lost her daughter, uh, Blasilla, in the, uh, uh, you know, that's the occasion for the writing. And he's writing to her and he's chiding her. And, and he's not shy about telling her that you know, you're mourning too much. What you're doing is unbecoming of a Christian woman who believes in the resurrection. I thought it was, in, in some sense, I thought it was a little strong. I said, oh, maybe I should not put this as the, as the lead off letter. But again, because of the chronology that was necessary. But that's one thing that a person of faith shouldn't do, Jerome says, is mourn too much. Because when we do that, we become self-centered. We, we collapse in on ourselves. A little mourning is okay, and he gives plenty of examples of Scripture, of uh, women and men, Old Testament and New Testament, who engage in the act of mourning. Uh, but at the same time, there's a limit to our grief because Christ conquered death. And there's a number of quotations he uses here. Sheol has been beaten because of the resurrection of Christ. So he's heavy into the Old Testament wisdom literature in speaking of the power of Christ over death. So one who is mourning is able to mourn, but should have limits to his mourning because, well, because Christ gives the cause for, uh, for our hope. One of my favorite quotes from these letters is, it might be from that letter as well, overabundant devotion towards one's children is an offense against God. Which is so bracing, and it's totally true. Um, I mean, Christ says as much, right? Um, but it is something that, you know, uh, to say to someone in mourning, granted, he knows that the people he is talking to are, uh, you know, spiritual people, and they're probably able to hear what he what he has to say. Um, but uh, it's still just striking, you know, uh, that somebody would just say that to somebody who's in mourning. Um, uh, and I think... Uh, it can reading that can probably challenge us to be, as you said, less less self indulgent um, in our sort of emotional 
a display. Yeah, Jerome doesn't hesitate. Through a few of the recipients, he doesn't hesitate to dish out what we would call today tough love. And I think right. Marcella gets, she gets the toughest of, of anyone. But I think that's also indicative of the nature of the relationship that Jerome had with her. And each of the seven letters has a brief introduction to the particular context of the letter. Who is the recipient? Who is the, the, the deceased? And what is the occasion for Jerome writing to that person? So it puts it in context. But with, as we mentioned before, with the exception of one, Jerome is writing to friends in every case. In some cases, they're, they're good friends whom he's known for years and prayed with. So he's not afraid to be open with them as we would expect a, a tough spiritual director to be with, with us on certain occasions as well. Yeah. Um, another letter, and this doesn't, uh, this isn't in, in part of the mourning or the, the consolation part exactly of one of the letters, but this is in the letter to Heliodorus, uh, St. Heliodorus. Um, and uh, he's talking at the very end about the attack uh, on Rome by the barbarians. And I just think this is such a great line. Um, and, and again, this is this is totally Old Testament wisdom that he's drawing on. And but I, I just think it's something that uh, in troubled times for the church or for one's country, Catholics need to be thinking in this way rather than sort of complaining and seeing themselves as victims all the time. I, I, this this great uh, passage, uh, he says, we are unhappy who displeased God so much that his anger rages against us through the fury of the barbarians. Hezekiah did penance and what? 185,000 Assyrians were destroyed in one night by a single angel. Jeho Jehoshaphat, sorry, Jehoshaphat sung praises to the Lord, and the Lord crushed his enemies in return. Moses fought Amalek not with a sword, but with prayer. If we wish to li be lifted up, we must first fall down in prayer. And earlier in the passage, he says, you know, because of our sins, the barbarians are strong. Because of our vices, the Roman army is overcome. Uh, so I think that you know, this idea of uh, suffering... The displeasure of God, you know, that the sort of the, 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 when God allows us to be defeated in some way or allows troubles to come our way, it can be because of our sins, or at least it can be, uh, a test that we're supposed to embrace of, uh, or a purification of some kind, um, if not a punishment per se. I think those are really valuable things to have in you know the spiritual repertoire as a Catholic, um, but something that I don't hear people talking about too much today. I guess it's just not fashionable to think of things that way. Even in traditional circles, I don't really hear people thinking that way very much. It tends to be more of a, you know, blaming things on whoever is the sort of the the material cause of the problems. It's definitely not fashionable. And I think of two examples in particular, the September 11th attacks and the COVID pandemic. There were articles written, you know, is this God, you know, issuing a plague on us? And apropos of what you were saying, people are very quick, Christian writers are very quick to say, uh, no, God doesn't do that anymore. Well, St. Jerome thinks so. <laughs> There is yes, something to be said for totally. you know, the penance. We, you know, we, penance is not always just voluntary. It's sometimes it is put upon us, and it's accepting those penances. That's really the challenge of the spiritual life. It's one thing to choose our own penance. It's another thing to have it given to us. And that's really where you know, Jerome, I think, would certainly support this, where we show our real love for God in enduring those penances with a, with a patient heart. Yeah, great. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about... Um, Jerome's strategies for con consolation then. So so what are some of the strategies that he uses um, in, in these letters to uh, to actually console someone as opposed to, you know, the parts where he's sort of just telling them to get their act together? <laughs> well, the, the, the act together would probably be the, the third part. So maybe going in reverse order, he's going to explain or urge the recipients to get their act together in this sense that now that you're no longer with that person, the particular, you know, think today when we may spend days and months or even years caring for an elderly parent or relative, and it consumes a lot of our time. Once that relative passes on, we suddenly are, we have more time. And Jerome isn't saying move on and forget about it. He's saying now that you have this new opportunity to serve the Lord in a new way. So he's urging his recipients to go do something for the Lord. And a couple of you know, since he was very much an ad advocate of the ascetic life and working with the poor, that's what he advocates the most. Go work with the poor. In Pamakius' case, who lost his wife, he says, go become a monk, go ahead. Uh, he uses that for another recipient as well. 
the idea of living for the Lord now in a new way, now with this person who having been passed on, there's a new occasion, a new call for the Christian. There's going, I guess, in reverse order, the second technique would be something that you know, could be seen in, the, in a secular sort of way, in the sense that rather than focusing on the, the person who's lost and say, oh, all these opportunities, I'll never get to do this, this, and this, and this person will never get to do X, Y, or Z, he urges us to look the other way and see the person as a gift from God. And rather than you know, feel sorrow for what could have been, to feel gratitude for what has been and what has been given to the Lord, because none of the, these relationships, we didn't earn them. They were all a gift from God in the first place. And Jerome exhorts us to take those, see those relationships in that way. And of course, the first way for any Christian is to focus on the resurrection, that Christ has conquered death, and with that, we have hope that those who have gone before us may rest in eternal peace with him. So death is not something to be feared for the Christian, Jerome says on multiple occasions, but something that, I would say welcome, but something that we, we don't fear because of the promise that lies on the other side. Um, is there a passage that you find most moving in these letters? Yes, it's that first letter where to Marcella where his daughter, Blasilla, is Jerome puts on her lips, mourning, uh, speaking to her mother, you know, speaking to her from heaven, and saying, "This is what we were talking about before about excessive grief." He says, "Mother, you know, why do you mourn for me? Don't you realize that I'm here with the Blessed Mother? I'm here with Anna the prophetess. There's no reason to be sorrow from, sorrowful for me. I'm sorrowful for you who continue on in this world in this valley of tears." It's so moving to put the words of the the one who has died, on yeah, addressing her mother and, and slightly reprimanding her to say, hey, there's no reason for you to be mourning right now because I'm with the Lord. I think, that, I think that's, yeah. of all of the pastors, there's a couple that are really good. Um, that one, for me, stands out the most. Yeah, I, I'm going to read this passage, actually. I just want people to get a little bit of a taste of the, the, the more moving parts of Jerome's writing. So uh, Jerome begins introducing these hypothetical words of St. Blasilla. Do you think that our Blasilla now suffers these crosses, that she bears these torments, because she sees that Christ is a bit angry with you, referring to um, uh, Paula being uh, displeasing God with her excessive mourning? Now she shouts to you who are mourning, If you have ever loved me, mother, if you nursed me, if you taught me with your admonitions, do not begrudge my glory. Do not act so, lest we be separated from each other forever. Do you think that I am alone? I have in your place Mary, the mother of the Lord. Here I see many whom I did not know before. Oh, how much greater is this heavenly company? I am with Anna, the prophetess in Luke's gospel. May you rejoice even more as in three months I have obtained the reward of many years of labor. That's referring to the fact that um, Blasilla had sort of dev devoted her, her, herself to God uh, only in the few months uh, prior to her death and had been living maybe a, a slightly more worldly life before that. He continues, um, We each have received the palm of chastity. Do you pity me because I have left the world? Rather, I grieve for the lot of all of you whom the world's prison still enfolds. You who fight daily in battle are lured to ruin now by anger, now by avarice, now by lust, now by the enticements of various vices. If you wish to be my mother, see to it that you please Christ. I do not recognize as a mother she who displeases my Lord. Um, so, yeah, it's a pretty awesome... Uh, awesome passage there. You mentioned directing the bereaved to dedicate themselves more radically to God. Um, this is one of the most striking and challenging parts of these letters. Now, uh, I'm not particularly bereaved, uh, but I am single. Um, and so I, I would say that one thing I've been taking away from these letters is just praying more about what, how am I supposed to be using uh, the extra time that I do have? You know, how could I be serving the poor? How could I be giving myself more radically? Um, Another challenging thing, um, not in a concrete way for me, but just sort of the idea of it, uh, is his frequent praise of various um, people in the letters, either the people he's writing to or about, uh, for practicing continence in marriage after their childbearing years are over. This is something that he he really recommends to people, um, and there are a number of different married couples uh, discussed in the letters who have done this um, in the period before the death of one of the spouses. Um, and so that's very interesting because that's another thing we don't hear people talk about uh, much today. Uh, and, and that's partially because, sure, you can say, yes, the church has emphasized more the positive aspect.
aspects of sexuality or of, of uh, marriage rather than well, uh, not not the positive aspects because procreation is a positive aspect, but but other aspects, let's say, than just procreation. Um, but uh, this is, um, you know, uh, I don't want to be so quick to dismiss this as just of its time or, you know, that he doesn't appreciate the normal life of marriage enough. And so he's trying to turn married people into monks as quickly as possible. Um, so it's just interesting to be to to let oneself be challenged by reading those things and considering, OK, maybe this is actually kind of an ideal even for married couples um, that like once you've sort of accomplished the the purpose of marriage in uh insofar as bearing children is is the purpose then then you can turn to almost a more monastic life within marriage it's interesting you, you bring that up because as you're saying i was thinking of it so jerome of course is not a member of the magisterium he's a, a priest and a monk so he doesn't have he's not speaking in an official capacity but as you said he's advocating continence for those who are married after their childbearing years in the church today it's almost a 180 perspectives. What was the big issue controversy in the so Pro Francis encyclical Morris Letizia? It was what to do with uh, Catholics who were divorced and remarried without having their first marriages nulled. Can they still uh, receive communion if they are not practicing continence? And there is a movement among you know, certain clergy to say, yeah, they should be able to, as if pra you know, practicing continence is too difficult. And it's, here we are you know, 16 centuries later and a new situation taking an opposite perspective. So certain churchmen, of course, not all, but uh, it's interesting to think of it in those terms. Yeah. And in fact, one of the letters does refer to uh, is about the, the death of a woman uh, whose name I'm blanking on at the moment. But she uh, earlier in life, she had been married to a man who was very vicious, I, I think, uh, vicious in his sexual habits uh, seems to be the case. Uh, and to the point that she uh, separated and divorced for, divorced him. And this was a young woman. And then she remarried before her husband had had died and then later she does great penance for this and and uh proceeds to you know a life of of celibacy um but uh again yeah the very a very opposite situation in that he and he and he actually you know um jerome is compassionate towards even her original situation he says well maybe that you know she's uh, we can understand why she did this. She was a young woman. She she needed a husband. It's better to marry th th than to burn, as St. Paul says. Um, so the problem is that her her first husband uh, was still alive, but but she separated from him for good reasons. And so he's he's very understanding, even while recognizing that it was wrong for her to remarry while her first, first husband was still alive. So yeah, it is very interesting to compare. One thing that people emphasize now, you know, Orthodox, well catechized Catholics emphasize about death, funerals, mourning, is praying for the dead, not presuming that everybody is saved. Um, you know, you hear people criticize the practice of delivering eulogies at funeral masses, which we're not supposed to do according to church law, and uh, and of sort of just having funerals be this kind of happy clappy event uh where it's assumed that you know that the person is not in any any danger or was not in any danger at death or or uh you know it does not need prayers now that they may be in purgatory um now jerome men makes maybe one ambiguous reference to like making spiritual like sort of gifts to the dead or praying for the dead maybe but it's it's not clear whether that's for to help them or more just in their honor. There's really no mention of purgatory. And I don't know how much of that is because of the doctrine being less developed um, at this time, um, because I know there are there is a sense of a sense of purgation after death, even in this period, um, as Peter Brown writes about. But um, uh, I think I think another big aspect of it is probably because so many of the people he's writing to and about are already quite holy. And so he is very confident in all of these cases that he's writing about pretty much that that the deceased is in heaven. Um, and so I think that based on the circumstances, he's justified in having this kind of confidence. Um, but uh, one question that it brings up for me is that um, is that, uh, you know, most people are not in this situation when they have lost a loved one. Um, most people, you know, most good Catholics probably assume that their loved one is in purgatory. Um, 
And, uh, you know, Jerome doesn't talk about that. But then a lot of people also have lost people who may have been estranged from the church, may have been living in sin. And to all, you know, sure, we can't judge the internal, you know, soul at the last moments before death. But uh, uh, the people in antiquity often had no problem up to the modern era. Uh, Catholic saints and doctor of the church had no problem talking about, you know, uh, people who died uh, with no external, you know, sign of repentance, they they were pretty certain they were in hell. Now we say, oh, you can't say somebody's in it. You can't, you can't, we have no idea whatsoever where anybody is. But, you know, when you read some doctor of the church talking about some heretic who died estranged from the church, they, they pretty much say, yeah, he's in hell now. Um, so uh, anyway, that's kind of a tangent. But um, what about people who are fearing for the souls of their loved ones? You know, a faithful Catholic who's mourning, um, or maybe a Catholic who is a little complacent and and should be more concerned about the fate of their their de- you know their deceased loved one. Um, what do these letters have to say to people who are in more ordinary situations where you don't have this confidence that the person is in heaven? Well, I think the reason why we can have confidence even for the, the saints among us who die is because of the resurrection of the Lord. Like Mother Teresa. And you know, Saint Therese of the Sioux come to mind as saying, "It's not Saint Therese of the Sioux. I, I go to the Lord with empty hands. It's not anything that I've done. It's because of the Lord's mercy and because of the cross of Christ that I am able to come into heaven." Mother Teresa would say the same thing. So uh, the reason why we can hope for the saints is because Christ went before them in the resurrection, and likewise, we can have some hope for those who have you know, lived a sinful life, a licentious life, a life away from the church just because the Lord is merciful. And even though he's perfectly just, he's also perfectly merciful. How that works out in a way of meeting out eternal salvation is for God and not for us. It's probably a good thing that God is in charge of that decision and not you or me or any other human being. But nevertheless, right. the hope lies in the resurrection. So after death, it's always worth, even for someone who dies in the most ignoble of circumstances or ways, we could, beyond the horizon of this of what we can see we could put our trust in, in the lord and the resurrection that he, he did die for all and he rose for all of course the flip of that is we need to accept that but we know as catholics that some of our prayers and masses for the dead can help make up for the deficiency of the deceased so we should never even though there may be very good cause to despair for a deceased who uh, died in ignoble ways or circumstances Nevertheless, if we put our focus on the, the Christ's cross and then on his resurrection, that gives us hope. And that's where Jerome wants us to put the saints, and I think we could put the, the sinners as well in the same place, on the cross with Christ, and hope that he will take care of things for us rather than we ourselves. Now, a lot of this, uh, as you note in some of your introductions, some of these letters are more eulogies or encomia for the deceased rather than consolation, strictly speaking. So... Um, I think it might be worth just going through some of these individuals uh, that he's writing about, um, especially those who are saints and and talking about, um, you know, the remarkable characters that we get introduced to, because that was another of my big takeaways from the book is just getting to know some of these people, um, especially the family of uh, Paula. So why don't you maybe at least tell us about the, the, uh, the Paula and her her whole family and all these people who come up in multiple right. letters. By so Jerome. Paula is where the, the family around. I was calling her Marcella before. And Paula and Marcella are friends, and in Rome, Joe, Jerome was both their spiritual directors. And some of Paula's children are recipients of these letters. And he refers to this. He writes to Pamachius, who's the son-in-law of Paula, as one of the the cherubim, one of the four cherubim of Ezekiel. And he uses that their family. One of them, Lucilla, took the. The, the wing of of uh, chastity, and you are taking the the wing of charity to others. So he, he's we get this, an insight into his relationship to this family, and again, the ancient so much of the ancient world is lost to us. And when we think of Saint Jerome, we just think of him as you know, try to picture him in front of a desk, just uh, translating scripture. But there's a real spiritual side of him. There's also, as an interesting aside, he, some people who know of his background, as quite the intellectual, he was engaged in many of the intellectual controversies of the time, writing and some thunderous polemics that we could read and look at and say, mm, this guy's saint, wait a second, what's going on? These are, some of these are pretty some strong language here. But here we see in these consolation letters, we, we see this tender side of Jerome who realizes that the, the task of salvation and of the perseverance 
is so important in living the spiritual life. And he's, you know, he's bringing these, these families for us. These are real people. And I think we can read them, as you're suggesting, and appreciate who they were in their time. But I think we can also read them and think of people in our own lives who have gone before us, who, uh, who maybe are, resemble an uncle or, or a child or you know, someone we knew growing up. In those ways, it becomes an exercise of the moral imagination that we can picture, we can come across the, the, the gulf of time and picture our own life within the lives of the ones Jerome is telling. So as, through this connection that we have through the communion of saints, we're able to use our imagination to have the Lord speak to us today in our own relationships as we, as we read Jerome and his relationship so many years earlier. Right. Right, right, yeah, and I mean, it's, it is just remarkable that the the people who surrounded Jerome, um, you know, I guess I guess it's not surprising that people who were looking for holiness sought out this guy who was you know famed as an ascetic and as you know a, a scripture expert. Um, uh, but yeah, it is a, it is a striking thing to just read about all of his different friends and the whole family of uh, you know. Um, Paula and who's who's a who's a chaste widow. Uh, he's charitable towards the poor. Blasilla and uh, who's the other daughter? Daughter Paulina, who's a married woman, but a ver very virtuous married woman, and her husband Pomachius, who is also very virtuous. And I think uh, he he writes a letter to Pomachius mourning the death of Paulina, if I'm not mistaken. And then he you know directs Pomachius to give himself more to the service of the poor and and. Uh, all of that. So um, it's just a great like constellation of uh, of characters and, and saints in some of these letters. Um, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you'd like to highlight about these these letters before we go? I think that last point is one I just wanted to reiterate is that you know, these we, through the communion of saints, we can really cross time periods and see ourselves and our family and our friends in these relationships that Jerome has. Jerome's relationship to his friends would be no different from his relationship to our relationship to our own friends and to our own family. And particularly in situations where you know, we lose loved ones who, who are young. I received a very interesting email from the mother of a former student. Her uncle is 95. I just received this last week. And he lost his wife and uh, his 22-year-old grandson two years ago and has been mm. rather unpleasant to deal with since. He, I don't know who, who, how he got the book, but he read Jerome's Tears, and I wasn't told what exactly it was that tipped him off, but the letters really consoled him. In reading here, reading about the, you know, a lost spouse and a lost child, something clicked in his head that he, not only did he feel much better and feel like he finally conquered the, uh, the beast of bereavement that was holding him around the neck, but also he's giving, he's part of a bereavement group in his parish in Pennsylvania, and he's bringing the book to read it in his bereavement group. So there's something about these letters that just, there's, it's, they're so magnificent in their, in their power and in their dependence on Christ and on the, the Holy Spirit that uh, it's worth taking time. And it's, it's not a long book. It's only a little bit more than 100 pages, but it's worth taking time to, to sit and you can almost pray with these words that they're so beautiful that Jerome writes in some you know, Some of it's, it's happenstance letter stuff, but others, when he's really digging into the scriptures and to the meat of the heart of our faith, you can really pray along with Jerome and not just read about Jerome. Yeah, that's great. Well, uh, David, thank you so much for coming on uh, and uh, for translating these letters. Very, very cool, very edifying to read them. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, all right, everybody. The book, again, is Jerome's Tears, Letters to Friends in Mourning. I, I didn't mention it was published by Sophia Institute Press, so I will link in the show notes for people to buy that if they want. Thank you for listening, and I will see you next time. The Catholic Culture Podcast is a production of catholicculture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Mike Aquilina, Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings. And Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical media resources, and much more at catholicculture.org.